Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome you to today's program, What's Next? Alternative Careers for Lawyers, sponsored by the Women in Law Section, the General Counsel's Committee of the Women in Law Section, the Young Lawyers Section, and the Committee on Continuing Legal Education of the New York State Bar Association. Today's program will run from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. And during the course of today's program, if you would like to pose a question to today's panel, please feel free to use the Q&A function in the Zoom portal, not the chat function. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to the chair of the General Counsel's Committee of the Women in Law Section, Petra De Silva, for some opening remarks. Petra? Good afternoon. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you for all of your help and all of your work. And thank you, everyone, for joining today's event. Today's event, What's Next? Alternative Careers for Lawyers, is really relevant and exciting and important for us to consider as we move forward in our <laughs> careers. As Ernesto mentioned, it's, it's sponsored by the Women in Law Section and the General Counsel's Committee, but also the Young Lawyers Section and the Committee on Continuing Legal Education. So we appreciate all of their efforts. The Women in Law Section is an exciting committee and a section to become involved in because it's one of the fastest growing committees for NISBA. We pride ourselves on having something for anyone interested in getting involved in issues related to women in the profession. We have a general counsel's committee, as I am the chair of the general counsel's committee, being an in-house lawyer. We also have a partner's committee, a legislative committee, gender issues committee, even a, a, a committee on champions, men advancing women in the profession. So there's something for anyone interested in these and in any issue related to women in the profession to get involved in, and we welcome you. We also welcome members and non-members to stay in touch with what's happening with the Women in Law section through our publication, Wills Connect, as well as on our webpage, as, which is part of the NISBA website. But let's get to business and get to our committee for our, our panel for today. I want to welcome Eve Balick, who will lead us in this discussion. Uh, oh, actually, uh, thank you, Ernesto, for bringing up the slides. There are uh, other events that I'll uh, mention before we get started. We have two upcoming events in April and May. The first, Getting to Ellen, a memoir about love, honesty, and gender, gender change, one of our book club events, as well as a breakfast event for partners, the partner section, uh, the partners committee. Uh, of Wills, uh, their quarterly breakfast event on May 2nd. So those involved in who are interested in those events, please join. So now I'll turn it over to Eve Balick of Griner Consulting Group to get us started in our discussion today. Thank you, Eve, and thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Fretra. Thank you, Ernesto, for having me and our other panelists here today. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with NISPA and this wonderful audience participating in this event. And uh, without further ado, I am going to introduce myself and then ask the other panelists to introduce themselves as well. Um, as Fretra said, I'm Eve Balick. I am at Griner Consulting Group. My title is Director of Coaching and Transition Services, very much a role, an alternative career path for a lawyer. Um, I'm a law career coach in this role. I work with um, private sector clients. The clients are um, mostly law firms and working with people transitioning into new roles or coaching them to grow in their current roles also professional development. So as you would imagine, that is a role that um, involves a lot of lawyer skills. Now I will ask uh, Jody to introduce herself, please. Hi, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for having me on the panel. My name is Jody Melman. I'm an attorney. I live in Poughkeepsie, New York, but I'm mostly or semi-retired. Um, I spend most of my time writing. I'm a crime fiction writer. I write a series called the Queen City Crime Series, um, with a new book coming out in May. I'm also um, a philanthropist. I'm involved with the Millman Harris Romano Foundation. It's a small family foundation that I manage. And I'm a member, a trustee of the Dyson Foundation, which is one of the largest family foundations in the Hudson Valley. We service the seven uh, uh, counties in the Hudson Valley area. Um, I'm also a, a book reviewer for Book Trib, 
which is an online service that reviews books. And I do a lot of other things, but um, oh, also I am the creator of what's known as the Writer's Law School and it's a program that advises writers on their legal rights. So as you can see, once you get to be a little older, you get to wear a lot of different hats. And I'm gonna pass the crown now to uh, Lawrence. Oh, thank you, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I've been, my name is Lawrence Shea, and I've been a senior legal editor at a company called Practical Law Division of Thompson Rogers since 2011. I started as a corporate lawyer at Shea and Gould. It was a long time ago. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Then I moved on to a series of other firms before working in-house, then my own business and private practice before joining uh, Practical Law, where I work with the commercial transactions team. Uh, out of all the aspects of legal practice, I enjoyed legal writing the most. Uh, but one of my first experiences in professional writing was to co-author a couple, a couple of how-to sports books because my kids played youth sports. Ironically, the writing style of the sports books was similar to the practical law writing style in terms of plain English and getting from point A to point B without a whole lot of fanfare. Then a light bulb went off and I pursued the idea of writing a footnote-free legal treatise about the structure of corporate transactions. And after that was published, I saw the job posting for practical law. So the transition for me was, was pretty smooth, even though my career path to practical law was kind of unusual. Most editors arrive directly from law firms and in-house positions, and we could talk about that later. Thank you. Okay, okay, I guess next. Hi, I'm Nancy Lissamore. I currently serve as an, uh, as an independent director on the boards of ComputerShare Trust Company and ComputerShare Delaware Trust Company. Uh, prior to my roles sitting on boards, I had an almost 30 year career at Citibank. Um, my most recent role and my longest role at Citi was global head of the depository receipt business which is a business that um, essentially gives U.S. investors the uh, access to the equity of global companies. Um, so, for example, we would facilitate companies like Alibaba, the Chinese company, uh, to list their equity on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I have an undergraduate finance degree from Rutgers University, a school of business, and I also graduated from Rutgers Law School in 1990. Um, I worked in a law firm for only one year, and then I started my career at City in 1991. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. So that's our panel. And um, Ernesto, if you could please pull up our slide deck. Thank you. So our program here, Alternative Careers for Lawyers, we're going to cover a lot of ground. Mostly we're going to start out by sharing our own stories, which are very instructive, for, um, for you to see the many things that law degrees can offer um, besides being a practicing lawyer. So next slide, please. And this is our panel who you just met. Next slide, please. So the types of skills that you have are transferable skills that go to many types of roles for you. These are just a few of the skills that we all have as lawyers. Persuasive communication, close and accurate reading and comprehension, writing, as Lawrence was speaking about, research, organization and time management, networking and relationship building. Now that is a super small list of all the many skills that we have, but these are highly transferable to, to many things. So um, next slide, please. So we're going to take the time in this program to talk about the panelists' journeys. Uh, we're gonna share our professional stories. I think you'll hear some things from each of us that might resonate with you. And you might think that sounds like me or feel a little bit inspired about a direction you might take. So uh, we're going to use these questions as a jumping off point, a loose jumping off point for the panelists to really dive a little deeper and tell their stories. So the questions um, we've pulled together are, where did you start? What factors led you to look beyond law practice? What roles did you take at your first pivot? And how did those lead you to where you are now? Now, I want the panelists to just feel comfortable to share however they want to share. These are just prompts. To, to get the conversation started. Um, I am actually on the panel as well. So I am going to lead us off and tell you 
my story. Um, I went to Cornell Law School. I went right out of college and I borrowed a bunch of money in law school. I came from a working class background. My parents were not college educated. I borrowed a lot of money, as I said. And so I ended up going into big law. I became a litigator at a big law firm. A, I started out at a now defunct firm uh, many years ago. It was called Finley Cumble. It was very large and a very long time ago. Um, meeting people is very important in your, in your career. Um, so when that firm fell apart, someone I knew was at Morgan Lewis and he was two years ahead of me and he helped me get in there. So I came over there as a third year. I stayed there till eighth year, paying off all my student loans. I'm very proud of that. But over the course of those several years, I realized I was not going to make this my career forever, but I didn't know what I wanted to do next. I ended up after that um, having three children in five or six years uh, in my early 30s. And I went to a nonprofit called, we moved to Montclair and I went to Montclair Community Pre-K. And I was fortunate because I got to try on many hats in that role. I did development. So things like grant writing, I was very well suited to. Uh, whereas you would imagine there's um, uh, a guideline and you kind of write a brief, <laughs> You're not that different. I did um, different kinds of fundraising, appeals, events, um, community building. I was fortunate at, at that job that I got to learn a lot. And as you're in a role like that, you figure out what speaks to you and what speaks to you less. After that, I went to a job I loved at a very wonderful organization called Girls Who Code. Girls Who Code is a nonprofit looking to close the gender gap in technology. Uh, the organization spoke to me. I was running a Girls Who Code club with my own daughter. I am not a coder. I was not really an educator. Um, and the role they gave me there was to start Girls Who Code clubs in New Jersey, where I live. So I took on that role. Um, I was good at it. And I uh, started um, Girls Who Code clubs all throughout New Jersey. My biggest partnership was with Newark Public Schools, where every middle school and high school in Newark Public Schools, 65 schools had Girls Who Code clubs. Mm -hmm. I was super proud of it and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And then I was a pandemic layoff. They laid off a lot of people. Um, and I was one of the people who went and I had to really think about what I liked about that job, what I was good at exactly, because it was a real change from being a lawyer. And I wasn't sure what to do next. It was an inflection point where I said, I'm ready to do something else and what's it gonna be? So um, I was helping my own kids get into college and I thought maybe college admissions will be the next place for me. So I took the bottom job at Seton Hall uh, University in admissions, $20 an hour. Um, my annual part-time, there was no vaccine yet. I had to go in person and um, it was really enjoyable. Uh, they offered me a full-time job right away. Um, it was not a job that paid very much and I felt it didn't have the right trajectory for me, but it got my foot in the door. I said, I think there's a law school here. <laughs> I reached out to the law school and went over to career services and took the bottom job they had there in career services, but it was a really good job. And I absolutely loved it. And I had now reached a point in my life where I had done different jobs. I had been through the associate track. I, I really had something to offer as um, a career counselor. Um, because I worked at Girls Who Code and in undergraduate admissions, I could really pitch myself as a counselor at this job. Um, soon enough, the executive director left and I found myself as the executive director of career services at Seton Hall Law School. I liked it a lot. And I was looking through my LinkedIn feed and I saw my current job 
posted. And I thought, this is career services for grown up lawyers. And this is going to be so much more interesting to me because it's not the same thing all the time of one L's and two L's every year, like a Groundhog Day situation. It's going to be fascinating, unique situations where I can really pull together all all of my skills. Um, I think I would not have been suited to this job when I had the girls who code layoff. I think I really had to go through these steps. And um, I love it here. Um, it's a wonderful role. I told you about it up top. And uh, I help people. It, um, it's intellectual. I feel good about it. It's creative. It's, it's a lot of good stuff. So, so that's my story. And um, this time I will pass it to Nancy. Oh, okay. We're going to start bottom up. So, uh, <laughs> my story, um, well, during, you know, during law school, I did clerk at firms. And when I graduated, I worked in a firm doing mostly contract and labor law, but I knew it was a short-term stop for me as I was really focused on transitioning to banking. Um, but I love learning about the law. I love the analytical aspects of the law. And I really liked working with lawyers. Uh, but I came to realize that I did not enjoy practicing law. I did not like the writing and drafting. Uh, I really didn't like the timesheets and the billing. And But I wanted to find something where I could use my legal skills, but on the client side. Um, and banking provided that path for me. So I started an entry level position at Citibank. Um, I worked in the Latin American debt restructuring team. I was a transactor. I worked with outside counsel on the term sheets and I would explain the terms to the other banks in the syndicate and get them to sign on to the deal. Uh, this first position, I would say, really solidified um, my desire to work on transactions and deals on the banking side, though. Uh, and then from that role, I ended up getting a position um, with the depository receipt business, which I explained before is an equity business for global companies. So I found the business itself very interesting. Um, and there also, I worked as an individual transactor, but there I was working with lots of external counsel, external counsel for city, external counsel for underwriters, for the issuers. And we were working on capital raising deals. So we were working on global IPOs in companies that were listing on the New York Stock Exchange or perhaps the London Stock Exchange or other foreign exchanges. And many times the legal issues we were trying to resolve were really complex because we had to bridge the gap between US law and the law of the foreign country. So, you know, my background in law really helped kind of solve the problems because it had to work from a banking uh, operational perspective as well as from a legal perspective. So I was happy that the lawyers did the drafting and I did the reviewing. So we did transactions in over 60 countries. And then from this individual transaction role, I eventually was promoted to manager of this uh, larger transaction group. And then after a number of years doing that, I was promoted to the global head of the depository receipt business, where I spent um, 15 years in that role. Now, as the global head of the business, I was also involved in legal issues, not so much the day-to-day -day transactional legal issues, but much broader, much more complex issues. We were involved in um, complex multinational tax issues. Um, I was involved in a class action suit that went on for a number of years. We always had regulatory issues and very complicated securities law issues. Um, so I loved my job at City. I did it for 30 years, but I got came to the point that I wanted to do something else in the last 10 or 15 years of my career. And so after retiring from City, it seemed like a natural fit to join a board. So once again, now I sit on a board and I heavily rely not only on my business skills, but also my legal skills. So that is my story. That is wonderful. Thank you, Nancy. 
Uh, Lawrence, would you be so kind as to go next? Sure. Uh, my stories are not you know, as interesting as, as yours or Nancy's, and presumably from, from Jody's uh, initial introduction, uh, hers. Uh, yeah, it's pretty straight line. I started at a law firm, uh, decided to get international experience, so I went to Japan to work for uh, uh, a Japanese law firm doing English, English language transactions and then returned to another U.S. law firm and then in-house. And I, I just want, I, I think, you know, in terms of, uh, from my own experience, I would say that I, I definitely didn't enjoy the, the practice of law for, for a variety of reasons because of the uh, personalities and stuff like that and just the, the billables and, 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 the, and the, the triage, constant, you know, triage type of situation. Uh, but, I, I, you know, big mistake that I made was, you know, I started, I started, I, I left the practice of law to start my own business. The business I picked was import-export. Huge mistake. I would say never leave the practice of law, no matter how much you hate your situation or or whatever, to go to don't don't start a company just because you hate your current job, and don't do it on a lark. You, you really got to plan it. I was fortunate because my wife was working nonstop since graduating college, um, so I, pure definition of privilege in my case. So I had the luxury of being able to quote quote unquote find myself over time. Um, so that that's that's what I would say. Um, and um, never take your law degree for granted. Get good at what you do because, you know, even if you don't like to practice law and want to find something else to do, um, for example, practical law, we're not going to hire anyone to be an editor unless they're, they're, they were a good lawyer. You know, they, many, many of the editors of practical law were partners at law firms and, and uh, senior counsel in, in, in law firms are in-house. So get good at what, you, what you're doing, even if you might not like the situation that you're currently in, might not like the practice of law, and maybe that's why you're here. Um, um, so that's, uh, that's kind of my tangential kind of story there. Well, before I ask Jody her story, I'm just going to take issue with that not being an interesting story because it was <laughs> very interesting. A story <laughs> and, of what and not wonderful. to do. <laughs> and Jody. Well, it's it's interesting because I think my story is probably the longest story of all of these, believe it or not, because I was introduced to the practice of law when I was 14 years old. And I got a job in a law office working for an attorney whose wife wanted time off during the summer. And that once I I worked as his legal secretary and his assistant, I was sitting there thinking to myself, you know, it came relatively easy and natural to me. And I said, why should I be a legal secretary when I can be an attorney? And this was at a time when women didn't go to law school. You have to understand this. This was in the 60s and very few women were attending law school. And so here I was at 14, I decided I wanted to go to law school and I really had tunnel vision all the way through the time I went to college at Syracuse University, and then I went to Syracuse University Law School. And again, I was admitted to law school at a time where the law was changing and law schools were required to admit 25% of their class had to be women. So fortunately, that's how I got, I, I attended law school. And I knew all, I also knew all along that I was interested in the arts because I was always a pretty artistic kid. So I knew somewhere along the line, I wanted to combine my, my passion for art and my passion for law. But that, at the time I was in law school, I wanted to go into the music industry and it kind of crashed. That was in the late seventies. So I couldn't get a job. Um, I attended NYU for my last year of law school, where I took what was known as their trade regulations. Today it would be called intellectual property. But as a, an L3, I was able to basically get my master's in IP um, at that time. So it was really kind of exciting to me, except again, the industries that were crashing um, and I ended up moving back home and I got a job as at the other end of the spectrum as assistant corporation counsel for the city of Poughkeepsie. So I did that because, again, when I moved back to Poughkeepsie, I was one of six women that was practicing law in the city of Poughkeepsie. And it was very, very difficult for me to find a job. So fortunately, I was able to get a job with the city and I worked there for a few years. Then I went to work for a very small firm. And being in a small firm, um, I always 
I had to do what someone else wanted to do, not what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, my path again was one where I had to determine my own destiny. And I never, I never really wanted to work for a big firm. I always wanted to carve my own path. So that's what I did. Eventually, after working for the small firm, I opened my own practice. And I, I had a, a, a fairly substantial practice, I would have to say, for about 20 years. And during that time, I did a lot of, I became um, specialized not only in copyright and entertainment work, which, and I did a lot of broadcasting work. Um, and I also um, specialized in matrimonial litigation and did a lot of high profile divorces and matrimonial situations here in Dutchess County. There came a point where my husband um, was transferred out to Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I had no choice. I closed my office mm -hmm. after having my own office for many, many years. I was admitted to the Michigan bar, but once I got out there, the laws in, very, in Michigan are very bizarre. So I decided that at that time, it was time for me to make a transition. So I was a young lawyer. I mean, I was still in my 40s at that point, And I had the opportunity to write. And the first opportunity was to um, continue on with a series of nonfiction books called Seats, which is a guide to, the, <coughs> to Broadway. So mm -hmm. my first writing experience was moving into doing nonfiction work. So it was kind of being an editor because I was controlling a team of I had researchers, I had artists, I had graphic designers. So my first job was really being a lawyer and supervising all of these people and coordinating this particular uh, project. At the same time, I knew that I wanted to move a little bit into the fiction realm. So I started um, taking classes in, um, I got my master's in um, English literature. And at that time, I specialized in law and literature, which is a very fine specialty. So I went on, got my master's in law and literature. While I'm writing my seat series, I'm also going on to teach law school. I taught law and literature at the University of Detroit Mercy Law School for several years. And then we move back to New, we move back to New York. So again, I'm transitioning. So at that point, I'm transitioning. I'm saying, okay, this is when I'm going to start to write my fiction. So I was teaching, adjunct teaching at Marist. I became involved in philanthropy um, by, by being joining the Dyson Foundation. And also, when I was in private practice, I represented a gentleman who um, had a substantial estate and died without any, any heirs and decided that he wanted all of his money to go to charity. So instead of making distributions out of his estate, we created a foundation. And over the course of the year, over the course of the years, we've given over a half million dollars out through this foundation. So I'm administering his foundation. So as you can see, my path is really taken. It's, it's not, it's never been straightforward. I don't think I ever wanted it to be straightforward, but I was able to take all of my legal skills and use them in the, in the area of philanthropy and also in the area of writing. And then when I decided to write fiction, and I'll make this very quick, I decided to write legal fiction and crime fiction. I decided to use my skills and write what I knew. So that's how I came up with my Queen City Crime series. So as you can see, um, everything's really started the law and continues and probably always will be. I always consider myself a lawyer first, even though I'm not practicing law every day. That's great. I mean, as you can hear from everyone's stories, uh, different paths, same skills lead in different directions. And really, there's so much you can do. Next slide, please. So uh, everyone has told their stories and if there's anything you'd like to speak to here, I'm going to start. Uh, powerful lessons we've learned along the way and utilizing tools and resources to high impact. I would say this, you could consider this tips, <laughs> however you wanna share tips. Um, my couple of tips I'd really like to, or however you would like to answer these questions, but my couple of tips I'd really like to share with you are um, just to, to 
put yourself out there. Um, I'm extroverted. I like events. I like people. So this is easy for me to say and the way I would do it. But you do you. You put yourself out there the way you're comfortable doing so. And my couple of examples are um, I went to Cornell Law School and just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I went to the Cornell Women's Law alum group had an event here in Manhattan. They had planned it for March 2020, and it was postponed for three years. And then it happened. And it was a really wonderful event. Um, often when people are transitioning to new roles or they don't know what they want to do, they don't put themselves into those situations with those high powered groups because they feel maybe they're not so comfortable with their own place at that table. But I've done everything I already needed to do just by going to Cornell Law School to be at an event like that. And it was really meaningful and enjoyable. I felt like family. And the keynote speaker then invited me to a Dress for Success event, which was a wonderful event as well. And that, I mean, I was just going because I was super interested for these events, but I am currently a law career coach, right? So Dress for Success is a wonderful natural fit in terms of we could help <laughs> with that. So by putting myself in one room, I then ended up in another room that was great for me. Um, the other one I'll share is Morgan Lewis has an alumni network. It's a wonderful network of people, you know, at law firms, not a lot of people stay, many people go on. So there's a networking group and um, I go to Morgan Lewis events here in the city and I'm part of this networking community. So I would say, my best tip would be, you've already done what you needed to do to develop a lot of networks. Tap into them and enjoy it. You've, you've earned this respect and these relationships. And I encourage you to, um, to explore them at this time. Anyone else, you can just go right ahead. You know, one of the things that, and I'm gonna kind of build on what you, you just said, Eve. Um, part of this is that when you're moving to a new, um, a new sphere. You should really research that sphere. First of all, you have to look inside yourself and see what you're passionate about. I mean, I'm passionate about the arts. You might be passionate about science. You might be passionate about the environment. And if you're thinking about transitioning into a, another field, do some research. Um, join an organization that's related. Um, first of all, any, as soon as somebody, you join a different organization, they find out you're an attorney, you're going to be their best friend. Trust me. You know, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to want to bring you into the fold. Um, let's say you're passionate about libraries. Get involved with your local library. See where that goes. For me, I joined what's known as, it was called International Thriller Writers. And I started to go to conventions. And through those conventions, I started to make a network of friends who are writers, a network of friends who are editors, a network, network of friends who are agents. So it's all of those people and skills that I didn't have as a lawyer. And first of all, they were happy to talk to me because I was a lawyer. And that's how I ended up developing my lawyers, my writer's law school, because I found all these people had questions for me. But find something you're passionate about and then do your research, do your homework. And, you know, one thing that my father always said to me, my mother always says to me, said to me was, and she always says to me, is, don't quit your job before you have another one. So do your research and that's when you, before you make that big leap. Uh, Nancy or Lawrence, would you like to chime in? Uh, I'll add, um, I mean, I was, I was young when I left the practice of law and I was really nervous. I had worked really hard in law school and to pass the, I passed the New York and New Jersey bars and everybody was so proud of me. And then I only worked in a firm for a year. And I was like, am I, did I just waste all that time and all that money? And I had loans and am I permanently shutting the door on practicing law? Maybe I should just stick with it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be self-aware and do what you're good at and what makes you happy. And now after 30 years, I have the benefit of hindsight and I don't regret my career decisions at all. I had a 
wonderful, fun, successful career at City. I was able to travel around the world. I met great people. I, I dealt with really complex legal issues. Um, and I can look back and say that my legal education strongly enhanced my skill set and significantly added to my credentials, right? Because lots of people are bankers and lots of people come in with business degrees, but there weren't as many people that also had a legal degree. I will say I was surprised when I got to City how many lawyers there were in non-legal jobs. There's a lot of people that are in compliance and risk um, or as transactors, how I started or running businesses that are lawyers by education, but are now working in the business. And you don't have to think of it as a permanent transition. I always knew that I could go back. It might be difficult to step back, but I do know people that did that. They worked in banking for a few years and then went back to a law firm. I always kept my uh, New York and New Jersey bars active. I did all the CLE classes and requirements. Um, and I just recently went on retirement status. So, you know, you don't have to think of it as a forever decision, but take a path that you think is something that you will enjoy. Thanks, Nancy. Lawrence? I would add, yeah, I would add, um, uh, you know, even though you may be thinking about, you know, alternative legal careers to, you know, why, why did you go to law school in the first place in terms of, you know, enjoying the concept of, of learning about the law? Maybe you, I would, in the meantime, continue to do the 10,000 reps. You know, they say that uh, that to become an expert in anything, including any area of law, it, it takes uh, an hour of reading a day for seven years. And then you really start to get to know the stuff inside and out. And at, at that point, uh, you know, you go in with with confidence and you have that 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 background. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, to be able to tackle uh, uh, anything. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to now share some some uh, guidance on how you figure out what to do next and what some options are. So uh, Take a deep dive. You explore your skill set and merge your current skills with what inspires you. Make a list of roles that blend the two and uh, favor what you love over what you do well is one school of thought. Seek feedback on your skills from colleagues and your network. You might be overlooking some key skills you have. Be a copycat. Follow the paths of those who've made moves that interest you. Talk to others. Um, embrace the long game. So this was something that I would say I did. Uh, uh, you, you may move from uh, on lily pads. Maybe you won't go straight from role A to role C, but you can go from A to B to C, as I did with the admissions all the way to now this career coaching. Leverage your network. You know I'm a fan. Maintain key relationships reach out to your contacts and explore opportunities regularly. Um, at the bottom here, you'll see we got this from Indeed. There's just tons of resources on this subject. And as I roll through these slides, I would say to the panelists, if you see something you want to talk about, just please raise a finger or something. Next slide, please. Plotting your course, the three C's, courage, compare, and combine. Ask yourself the hard questions. This speaks to something Lauren, Lauren said. Um, run towards something, not just away from something. Have yourself a plan there. Uh, what needs to be improved and what do you have to do to change it? Take the time to window shop. That's something the co that we learn as coaches and, uh, and tell our clients to do. Explore the opportunities. Um, what roles and opportunities align with your goals? And finding your sweet spot, uh, where your interests and expertise intersect. This was um, information from Forbes. Um, next slide, please. Parallel growth. This is, uh, sometimes there are phrases that you know they exist, the, the concept, but you may not know what the words are. Since I became a coach, I learned the words for this concept of parallel growth. 
which means you keep your day job, you're doing what you're doing, but you explore your other interests along the way. Maybe you teach a class or write an article, join a committee or support an organization. We have a little show and tell. This is a book I like. It's, it's uh, referenced here at the bottom. It's called The Creative Lawyer by Michael Melcher. And that's where I grabbed this parallel growth idea. And you may be doing it and not even realizing you're doing it. Next slide, please. Find a niche and fill it. Um, I saw this New York Times article and I thought this was something people could think about as well. There's not just one way to figure out your next thing. Um, if there is a niche and it's something that speaks to you and you'd be good at it and there's a need for it, that is as a good a path as any other path. So we're just trying to brainstorm and create new opportunities for you to, to think about how you might go about your next step. Next slide. These are types of roles you could explore. So we're going to talk about law-related opportunities, um, also called JD Advantage, JD Preferred, meaning if you have a law degree, uh, you don't need a law degree for these roles. People without law degrees can get these roles too, but you're at an advantage or preferred when you apply for these kind of roles. Next slide, please. These are types of JD Advantage roles. Um, we reference at the bottom NALP, N-A-L-P, which is an excellent resource for people that you can look into. These were from their JD Advantage guide. So uh, as Nancy mentioned, compliance, contract management, finance, data privacy, these are all examples. Government affairs, HR and DE&I, insurance, risk, IP tech, um, operations and innovation, regulatory affairs, legal recruiting and professional development, legal marketing and business development, knowledge management, crisis management, mediation, legal tech, and legal journalism. Now, needless to say, that is not an exhaustive list at all, but you can see how you could easily jump using your law degree to a field like this where your law degree would put you at a huge advantage to people without a law degree and you'd use your legal skills. Next slide, please. Um, here, uh, a very non-exhaustive list of the many alternative careers to consider where up top, our first slide had your transferable skills. These are the types of things you can consider that we've been talking about and many more. Executive management and advisory, sales and marketing, employee relations, HR, recruiting, journalism, writing and academia, starting a business, creative positions, non-legal corporate roles, law adjacent roles, writing, mission-driven work, higher ed, and career services and coaching. And I saw there was some overlap in this list as I was uh, reviewing it, but you get the idea. Um, just kind of the sky's the limit with the skills you have. Next slide, please. These are some resources. Um, I Googled uh, alternative careers for lawyers. And if you go on Amazon, for example, or Goodreads or any resource you like, you will find so many resources and books like this. I commute from New Jersey, so I tend to read them to and from work. I have a whole little library <laughs> behind me there. So besides the creative lawyer, one I like um, is called Portfolio Life. Uh, it's one I'm reading now. You'll see my bookmarks in, in all these books. This one, uh, it's, it's aimed at people over 50, but it's really for anyone. Its position is, um, think of your life as a portfolio. 
work, health, uh, family, friends, your portfolio, and it changes over time. You shift your resources. Um, another one I like is called Designing Your Life. Uh, this author taught, these are two authors. They taught a course and then made it into a book because it was a popular course. And it's they take the design mindset and they say, don't just sit around thinking about what to do. Be like a designer, prototype, and go do stuff. Go try things out. Um, these kind of books will very much help you jumpstart, inspire you, speak to you to figure out the kinds of things you could do next. There you are. Yep. Yes, Lauren. Yeah. Uh, I did a little bit of research uh, also in, in uh, because I'm, I'm in the kind of knowledge management space, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, some editors at our firm went on to go back to law firms, interestingly, but not in practicing roles. So I, I, I discovered that there are at least four main areas that non-practicing attorneys can pursue back in law firms, uh, business development, professional development, knowledge management, and uh, legal tech, and if you know, uh, if you'd like, I can quickly run through what some of those are. We would love that. Sure. Uh, business development is a strategy function to help law firms increase profitability. So I did some internet job description research also. So tasks include client development, brand building, strategic initiatives, pitches, internal business analysis, competitive intelligence, event management, including speaking engagements, and a lot of these uh, job descriptions say college degree required, but MBA or JD preferred. So uh, to your point before, Eve. And then professional development function helps to train and coach the firm's lawyers on leadership and client relationship skills. So not substantive, but like uh, even listening skills, uh, training on staff utilization and workload management, associate evaluation processes, mentoring programs, DEI initiatives, et cetera. Uh, then there's knowledge management, which is a function in law firms, which is probably the closest thing to what a legal, legal editor role uh, is at Practical Law or Bloomberg Law or, or LexisNexis, for example. And tasks include helping the law firm's lawyers keep up to speed by curating, creating, and updating standard forms, checklists, guidance materials, precedents, and other substantive content, improve workflow processes, optimize legal technology, draft client alerts, et cetera. And finally, uh, legal tech, um, and um, uh, some some firms have even launched their own legal tech subsidiaries. Uh, for example, in 2019, a firm called Wilson Santini launched a software subsidiary called 650, which develops automated tools designed to make legal processes efficient and affordable. And there are lots of uh, startups in the legal tech uh, space. And um, and uh, uh, one of my, my my contacts, Joe Green, he he, he left Practical Law to, to become uh, head of innovation at Gunderson Detmer, and with a focus on transforming the firm's delivery uh, platform to 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 make uh, to provide a more modern and seamless workflow experience for both internal and exter external stakeholders. So there's there's lots of roles apparently for 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 lawyers who don't want to practice law anymore to even stay in law firms. Uh, to 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 become you know adjacent to the to the legal profession. Thanks. Yeah, that is such a good point. And for people like me who left law firm a law firm many years ago, really all these roles have come up since. Lawyers are law firms are keeping these roles in house keeping their best people from leaving, people who they've already trained, who know the firm culture. And um, if you are someone who is at a law firm and would be interested in one of these types of roles, remember your firm already likes you, you're, you're there. Um, and you don't necessarily have to be a lawyer at the law firm. One of my colleagues here was, in was a young corporate associate for a couple of years, and then went on to head professional development at a firm for many, many years. That was the bulk of her career. So ex exactly what you're talking about, Lawrence. All right, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Now, we are at the point in the program where we'd love to hear your questions. 
So um, it's been great uh, sharing all these resources with you. And we'd love to know what you'd like to know from us. So, um, so let's, let's get to some questions. I'll read one question. When you work in a company, not in a, trend, a traditional legal role, but work closely with attorneys, do you ever do any legal work in conjunction with your other duties? Also, do you still sign your email as Esquire if you aren't actually legal counsel at the company? And they asked lastly, are there ethical issues of working at a company in a non-legal role, but occasionally do, do legal work and do with inside slash outside counsel, i.e. you handle a simple real estate closing for the company, but use outside counsel for other matters? Oh, Nancy, I think you're on mute. Thank you. I said, I'll take that uh, because I worked at such a large institution. Uh, now, if you're working in a smaller place, it's a family owned business or something there, there might be um, more leeway. But if you work for a large corporate, there will be in-house counsel, general counsel. So for example, when I was at City, Fretcher was also at City and she was, the in-house counsel for our business. She, I was not allowed to act at, uh, position myself as a lawyer for city, right? We had insight counsel, they were the lawyers for city. I did not sign my name Esquire. I signed my name, managing director, my corporate title. So you do have to be careful when you're working for a large institution on um, representing yourself as their lawyer because you're not. So I would work on legal issues, but the determining factor of what the bank's position would be on a legal issue would come from in-house counsel and not from the business people. So now I could, I don't know if your question was whether I could do legal issue, legal work on my own as a personal matter, I mean, you can do certain things, but, you know, a lot of times you have to have a trust account. It just depends on what you're doing and, you know, who you're talking to. I'd have over the years, many times family members would ask me my uh, opinions on things or legal, you know, questions, and I would help them with that. But I was always very careful because I didn't have a trust account. I didn't have um, malpractice insurance. So I did not practice law outside of you know, just giving family and friends just general advice. Can can I talk a little bit to that point? Um, I'm kind of in that situation, similar situation, except um, I I don't have an office. I mean, I have an office phone. If people want to get in touch with me, but I still maintain my uh, my malpractice insurance, and I still do my CLE, and I still have my license. And this is even though on a daily basis I don't. I'm not practicing law because you never, honestly, you never know when a family member is going to ask you, well, I got a speeding ticket or can you help me with a closing? I generally practice what I call friends and family law. So I figured it's worth it for me to spend that couple hundred dollars to have that liability insurance and to take the CLE because today with CLE, I mean, there are just so many interesting things I want to know about anyway. Um, but for me, it's important to continue. To, I mean, I worked so hard to get that degree. It's worth it for me to spend a few thousand dollars a year to protect myself and to protect whoever I represent. Retra, do we have another question in the chat? Yes. So how do you handle the emotional challenges that come with changing your uh, career? Uh, a couple of you, um, stated that you took entry-level positions, um, that you did something, uh, that you had a question about whether you used your uh, degree um, after you left law school um, and after you had invested so much in it. How do you handle some of those emotional um, challenges or, uh, or positioning yourself outside uh, with other people? I will go first. And if anyone wants to answer that as well. 
Um, so that's a very fair question. We are so wrapped up in the identities that we've worked so hard to develop. You see yourself as a lawyer and you worked really hard to, to get that title. And um, there's a, a, an amount of prestige and um, you feel really good about that. So I would say you kind of have to, one thing is acknowledge that in yourself and just say, that's okay if I feel maybe I have mixed feelings about making this change. But the way I have always handled it within myself is saying, I'm going to use all these skills. Maybe I'm going to be using it in some different way. I also maintained my law license um, during COVID, I put myself in New York State in retired status and made myself an attorney emeritus so I could do volunteer work for New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. And um, my uh, my malpractice insurance was made, it was waived in some way that I could do this and my license fee was waived. Um, it is an emotional adjustment. I, I would have to agree with that. But I think I just felt like I was headed towards something that would make me happy and that I would always have this law degree and I could always feel proud of it and that I was still using it in some way. So that is my answer to that question. You know, being a lawyer is not, it's not the job. It's a mindset. And when you go to law school, you're being trained to think a certain way and analyze situations a certain way. And whether or not you're practicing law, that those analytical skills and your lawyer-like thinking is still going to be with you. So even though you're not, you know, doing cases every day, you're you're in your heart, you're still a lawyer. And I think, you know, so it is emotionally. It's difficult. I mean, I'm not going to say that there aren't days when I say to myself, oh, you know, what did I give up? But the point is you're you're doing you're you have to be true to yourself. And part of yourself will always be a lawyer. I, I agree with being true to yourself, definitely. Um part of it may be reframing the situation. You know, you you might be at a big law firm and you're kind of burned out or whatever, and you and and and, and you have to ask yourself, you know. I don't want to say, are you really cut out for this, but rather look back, look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, to get to the next point, you know, all my colleague, all of my, these colleagues are making partner or whatever. Are, are, are you willing to do the work and to make the sacrifices to get to that point? And if not, it doesn't mean that, that, that you're not successful. It means you, you could do something else and be, become a client actually. And, and of the, of the same firm that you left maybe, and, and be equally, if not more, uh, uh, successful, but to so you have to reframe, I think, in order to you know to 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 get through the initial stages of the transition. So true. Um, we so have I'll, another question. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, please. How do you deal with gaps in your resume while figuring out what you want to do? Um, since I'm a law career coach, I'll just take that one first because it comes up a lot in my life. I personally feel that since COVID <laughs> and with the ups and downs of the economy and life, it's just not the taboo that you that we always felt years ago that it used to be. Ideally, you'd like no gap and from one job to the next, but that may not be realistic for all of us these days. And I feel that there's just way less of a stigma if if that's not an option for you. Ideally, one job to the next, but not, we don't all live in that perfect world every day, is my feeling. Yeah, and I would say as someone who's hired a lot of people over the years, um, and people would regularly come in with gaps in their resume, it's, and I would always ask about it, it's really how you explain it. And I would focus more on the skills and making sure that they could articulate why they had a gap. I mean, it could have been that they were home raising children. It could have been that they they had a parent that was ill that they had to take care of, but they always framed it in what skills that they have or skills that they developed even when they took the gap. If they were a stay-at-home parent, they would say, oh, I you know, ran the PTA or I was doing these other things or I continued my um, education or 
uh, took legal credits or whatever kind of credits, business credits. So it's really how you can explain it and you should practice that, right? Practice on an interview because you know that question's coming. That is so true. Um, well, I see we are now at one o'clock. So uh, I think I would say thank you to everyone for being here. This has been a wonderful, enjoyable experience. And uh, support NISBA. <laughs> and thank you so much for having us, Fretra and Ernesto. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Jody, Lawrence, and Nancy. And it's certainly a pleasure being your lawyer, Nancy. Uh, and, and I'll just mention, it's great when you have lawyers who are your clients uh, as an in-house lawyer, because, you know, the level is just raised immediately. And so the exchange is at a different level. It's, it's really fantastic. So it's certainly a pleasure being your lawyer for many years. Uh, but thank you all for a, such a thoughtful and insightful conversation. And thank you, Ernesto, for organizing everything. And to our co-sponsors, the Young Lawyer Section, as well as the Committee on Continuing Legal Education. Um, we're so happy everyone was able to join us this afternoon. Please consider joining our events on April 22nd and May 2nd, and go on to the WILLS web, web page on the NISBA website. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And just echoing Fretris' uh, sentiments there, thank you all of the panelists for that terrific program. This does conclude the webinar. Please make sure to return to your My Learning dashboard and complete the course evaluation as your feedback is important to us to continue putting together quality programs. Thank you for choosing New York State Bar Association programs and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you all. Take yeah. care. Have a great day. Thank you.